Yeah, welcome everybody to the second session of uh, this uh, international conference on faith-driven investing walk the talk. Um, we have uh, participants, uh, over 100 to 150 participants around the world, but mainly from Africa and Europe. And this uh, plenary is about keynote speeches, briefly presenting a perspective on setting the scene, means impact and faith-driven investing in and after the corona pandemic. During the day, we will have breakout sessions. We will have other sessions focused on specific aspects, specific sectors, or specific investment uh, tools. But in this session, we want to set the scene, so to say. And we are very happy to have uh, uh, famous and very knowledgeable um, speakers uh, among us. Um, we will have uh, Anis Askar, he will join us soon, uh, and we can go uh, straight to the next one, and Kata on the list. And Kata Nyeru, uh, welcome, warm welcome. You are from Nairobi, and you are representing, you are the coordinator of the African Christian Health Association platform called ACHAP. And, uh, Health is a big issue in the whole question of the pandemic. As we all know, health is wealth, as we heard in the introduction from Isabel uh, Piri. And uh, we um, are keen to hear what you, in the few minutes that you have, will share with us about how do you deal in this uh, situation, the uh, the the health uh, situation and what can you as um, African continental health network uh, contribute uh, to, to this and where do you challenge us to support your efforts. Uh, welcome Anis, we started with uh, Nkata and we will come back to you in the uh, second speaker. Uh, Nkata, you have the floor. Thank you, Christoph. And, um just to make sure that you can hear me. Good, thank you. So um, I'm Kath Anjero from the Africa Christian Health Associations platform. That uh, is a platform that, uh, for Christian Health Associations uh, in Africa. Uh, we have membership in uh, 32 countries, uh, 43 national um, associations, and uh, which, are which are made up of uh, mission health facilities in different countries in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as drug supply organizations. Um, not to belabor the point about uh, what a year we've had in 2020, uh, definitely being in the health sector, uh, for us, uh, Christian health associations and mission hospitals, who in uh, some countries provide up to 70% of healthcare, mm -hmm. found ourselves in, um, in, in, in this crisis where in Africa, uh, so far more than 3.1 confirmed cases with uh, 74,000 deaths have happened. Uh, we live in a continent that is already, um, has, a, has a fragile healthcare system uh, that whose healthcare system is already overstretched and, it's, uh, and on its knees. And definitely this uh, pandemic definitely brought in um, new challenges. Um, Christian health associations and mission hospitals and the church in general um, got an opportunity to partner with governments, with private sector. And um, mm -hmm. the best thing about uh, faith-based organizations is that they, they are on the ground, they work with the, they, they are proper, uh, hard to reach areas. So we were able to quickly mobilize uh, our community uh, in many places to, to provide services. However, we were faced with uh, challenges that included the fact that uh, we were yet to understand this pandemic, what we needed to do and not to do. And a big one for us was the fact that um, this pandemic, uh, one of the instructions was that people need to stop congregating. And part of congregating is going to church. And that therefore meant that um, we had to find ways of passing messages to our churches to understand what is the relationship between going to church and the pandemic. 
So one of the first places we began was working with religious leaders as champions in communities to help people understand the COVID pandemic and to understand that the church is not necessarily the building, but uh, um, uh, the, the, the people and how we are able to uh, worship in other ways. So there, there were many needs that, were, uh, that, that uh, we have come across. Um, we continue to find homegrown solutions, but uh, some of these needs included, uh, one of the big ones was health infrastructure. Um, like I said, we are in, in uh, hard to reach areas and proper, so a lot of our services are very basic. Um, many of COVID, the COVID patients require um, emergency care, ICU care, and even our big referral hospitals did not have uh, critical care and emergency care um, equipment, as well as capacity. We also um, uh, experienced uh, a lot of uh, challenges with, uh, with uh, medical supplies. With the closing of the skies, um, many of the medicines in, in, in Africa and in a lot of places are imported from India and other countries, and we could not uh, access medicines, as well as gloves um, and other PPE supplies. I remember waiting for two months for a very, very needed supply of a thousand masks. Um, and at that moment, uh, uh, one, one face mask in Kenya was going for uh, not less than, uh, a, packet, a, a, a packet of 50 was not going for less than uh, 50 do US dollars, which, which is definitely not affordable. So our health workers did not have uh, those very um, easy to find items such as masks because um, a lot of our local industry was not making those. Then of course we had the overstretched um, uh, health workers. Uh, we already have a crisis of uh, uh, human resources for health in Africa. So this, this wasn't this crisis. Um, we also uh, realized the need for creating resilience in health systems that need to, to, to stand uh, shocks like this. Um, we also had problems when it came to um, other, um, other, other chronic illnesses. So people were afraid of going to hospital. So maternal and child health, uh, uh, women did not go for their antenatal clinics. Uh, people with chronic conditions did not go for their clinics. Uh, HIV patients missed their doses. Um, mental health, both uh, caring for the caregiver as well as spiritual health were affected. So having uh, provided this background, then I, I, I can touch a bit. Um, today is the first big test of the year for me, uh, Christoph, trying to fit in eight minutes, <laughs> all this, but I'll try. So uh, we, I, 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 I tried. We just had another two minutes left. Okay, no problem. I will, I will try to talk about what I think are the opportunities there for. Um, we have opportunities for innovation in a lot of areas. Uh, one of them is in leadership and governance. We need to uh, think about ways in which to change the way we work with people. Innovation around um, work, working virtually, uh, governance models. We also have opportunities in health, um, uh, big opportunities in health uh, management information systems. Uh, we need to uh, be innovative and find ways of uh, finding, uh, being able to uh, collect and use uh, information in reliable, accurate and uh, accurate ways and also be able to provide quality because this data is very important for us to make decisions, especially now. And especially now with the anticipation of the vaccine rollout in Africa, there's a lot of opportunity in, in, in technology in being able to uh, roll out the vaccine. Um, of course, supply chain, I've talked about all the things around supply chain. Uh, there's, a, there's opportunity in partnering with uh, Christian health associations and uh, in, in, in many countries where the, the supply chain has not developed to be able to uh, provide uh, opportunities for faith-based organizations to have uh, affordable medicines. Uh, of course, uh, capacity building of uh, human resource. Now that uh, people have, uh, have uh, embraced um, working virtually, 
we need to be innovative in ways that we provide uh, capacity building to people. And of course, uh, working with communities. How do we, uh, how do we ensure? If I may. Uh, okay. How do we ensure multi-sectoral um, collaboration? And I, I think, I think with that, um, with that uh, summary, we should be able to think around uh, some of the innovations that we can work together on and uh, make the 2021 a good year uh, to be able to invest together uh, in the health of the people that we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ankata, for these insights. And we see this, uh, all these constraints on the ground. And uh, as you said, uh, the uh, Christian Health Association of Africa is really on the ground in 33 countries. Uh, thank you so much for your engagement. We will have other opportunities today to exchange and after this conference. I'd like to hand over to Anis Askar. He is from a, a investor side and perspective and uh, oops, disappeared. Um, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, we don't see you. Ah, oh, yeah, no, you are back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, the needs, risk, opportunities for investing. I mean, it's uh, it's a big challenge, and uh, you have an excellent overview of of the world situation. You have the floor. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, all of us have uh, only, yeah, let's say seven minutes to speak, uh, but you're used to it. Anis, you have the floor. Very good. Thank you very much. So. Uh, what I really want to do is focus a little bit on uh, 2020, just to try to look at the market size uh, and what changes have been made. And I think I, I probably should start by saying that almost all investors uh, are asking, not just impact investing, but what happened to my investment? The, the change in the world globally has made such a significant difference. But there are always opportunities when the world changes. The market size for impact is around 700 billion today. It was, it was around 500 billion in 2015, it's grown. Uh, but when you look at the ESG market at 40 trillion, uh, it's uh, obviously a bit larger. But what I also want to focus on, uh, and the reason for giving you the figures of 700 billion, just uh, around that figure for impact, is that 85% of that market is foundations and asset managers. There's very little from banks, there's very little from the traditional uh, 400 trillion or so of the capital markets, uh, that's invested globally. So it's still quite a narrow sector. But that actually is uh, part, partly the reason why impact can have quite a bit of a change. COVID, of course, is going to affect all the capital markets. It's affected in many ways, both governments investing significant amounts in their own marketplace. There are about 45 million people in Europe alone on, on uh, employment schemes or furlough schemes. And those, that, that, those companies that are investing uh, heavy, heavily in their own employees through those schemes, by very nature of the fact that governments demand reporting, they increase the governance structure of their own businesses. And if those businesses survive uh, and, and don't remove those people because of the employment schemes, they already have increased their governance. So looking a little bit on impact, what's happened really to the way that impact has invested? There's probably three major elements. One is the pool of capital. There is a significant amount of liquidity in the market today to look at impact. The second, I think, which is really quite important for us uh, as, a, as both faith-driven investment and impact investment from foundations is that the metrics are better. We and UG, UGSI have been measuring uh, the top 500 people around the world in the way that they report. Uh, and if they don't report the SDGs, then they don't make the, the process. That's been taken up by significant uh, investment companies around the world. So ESG has got tighter. I think originally they started more on the environmental side. It was an easy pick. And so they, they, they chose particular investments that were more around investment on environmental. Now that's not acceptable. And so you move quite quickly to, uh, to the social side. You're looking at supply chain management, your staff welfare, and now also your customer base. So that, that has a significant interest to the pools of capital because people just no longer want to invest in what they don't like. What they, they want their investment to go in something that they, they feel is going to make a change. And I think that that's the, probably the first turn where it's not just 
investor returns, it's actually social returns. And that we see quite significantly in, late, in, in the later stages of 2020 when there has been movement in, in investment, but certainly in the start of 2021, what you see in RFQs is not just uh, the, the usual uh, tick boxing that you have, but there is an ESG, there is an impact and a social change. Turning now to governments for, for, for ESG, as I mentioned just now, it is really easy to see that governments need reporting because they are deploying significant amounts of capital. The rise in the, the capital markets balance sheet is so significant that the, by that very nature, it's bringing up the overall governance of, co of companies that need investment. Second part of this governance factor is when, a, when an investor looks to deploy capital, are they now just looking at returns? We don't really know what will happen from 2021, 2022. How long will this last? What will it affect the people and employees? So is suddenly Coca-Cola and Apple and Google the only uh, stocks that are going to make a difference? Probably not. Last part of that part of the market, before I talk a little bit more detail about impact, is that the emerging markets are much easier. Defensive assets have become quite expensive and higher risk because of the very nature of the market change. So the emerging markets probably have a higher level of impact investment than they have had historically by the very nature of the change in the global markets. So that's what we look at. We, we try to assess who is going to invest in impacts and why they're investing. And that is really, for me, a loud and clear choir that it has to be socially driven. Pension funds are no longer interested in, in fossil fuels. That's an easy part to stay. But what about a company that does very well but has a very poor supply chain management? Who's going to look at that? And that's what we measure at UNGSI. We have the SCR 500. People are excluded from that if they don't report what they do for the SDGs and by very, its very nature on its impact. So now just a quick, a quick uh, two minutes on some of the technologies. AI is an important part of all markets and, and investments, but, and blockchain as well. But what I want to look at very quickly is how an impact investor can use these technologies to make a selection. We have quite a number of, pro uh, of programs in UNGSI about how we chip a tree, for instance, reforestation. It's a relatively easy part to impact uh, on just saying that you've done reforestation. But now we can have full transparency in the way that the trees grow, how they're cut, what carbon emissions they reduce, what the deployment of that labor is. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's all a transparent process. And that the overall partnering of big data and AI allows an impact investor into areas that they've never looked at impact before because it can be measured so much better. And that's a really big part of what's gonna happen in 2021. With the impact market at 700 billion, but with the overlay of new technology, I think impact will grow quite a bit more than it has with 200 billion that it has done in the previous two years. So that's a quick look at the market. Uh, one, I want to just uh, finish with one thing that uh, <clears throat> is a, a quasi-impact investment, which we've never looked at before. Gene editing was banned in the European Union in 2018, but the UK now, with Brexit, has decided to start to look at that again. Gene editing is not genetic modification. It is actually a selection process for the animal and, and plant industry. And there is a large faith investment or, or faith argument on gene editing, simply because is it right or wrong? But natural selection has taken place since the dawn of time, and this is a process that will actually speed that up. It reduced pesticides, it reduced the amount of hormones. That is, is a process that uses science that would have not been deemed as impact, but the impact on both the climate, the environment, the people that farm, and the people that consume is significant. So is that an impact investment or is that not? So that's uh, my, my takeaway is that, that new markets as they emerge and new processes that emerge are deemed as impact now. And that we see with fresh capital coming into the market that we see a very good way to look at what impact can change in the way that it's going to, because we've clearly had a very strong impact in the last uh, uh, one year or so since, the, since the, uh, the COVID virus has hit us. Thank you so much, Anis. Uh, you raised a number of important topics, uh, reporting, measuring, transparency, also the, the, the new opportunities with AI, blockchain, and, and also the, 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 the growing uh, uh, 
so to say, uh, hope of for social return on or expected uh, social return. So this is a, a global, uh, some keywords which we should have in mind for the whole day and also beyond that. Uh, uh, Anis Askar is uh, uh, the CFO, so to say, of uh, the of Chief Investment Officer also of UNCSI Foundation, and, uh, but also a uh, member of the Oikos Invest Foundation, a foundation which focuses on investing in Africa, which, which is in the making. And uh, so that means we also have the opportunity then with you attendees to further explore concrete steps as the conference topic is walk the talk. And with that, I'd like to go to uh, Bruno Bobone. Bruno Bobone, welcome. You are the newly elected uh, president of UNIAPAC. UNIAPAC is the world leading um, institution or uh, network of uh, Catholic Christian um, entrepreneurs with a lot of members in, in uh, many countries. You will say more about that and uh, you are elected just now and you're most welcome. We in Geneva Gabe Foundation, we cooperated with uh, UNIAPAC uh, since uh, a number of years and uh, we have a partnership agreement. So you have the floor seven minutes uh, on, uh, the, uh, on UNIAPAC and the, Christ the contribution of Christian entrepreneurs for these uh, faith-driven investments. Bruno. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be able to uh, present in this uh, event. Yes, Union Park uh, is uh, an organization that is represented in uh, many countries around the world. We have 45,000 uh, members and uh, we are working a lot in many countries and we are working in Africa. I was uh, asked to speak uh, to you about the needs and opportunities of uh, investing for faith-driven investment uh, in, in Africa. I'm not sure I can give you much of the opportunities, but I definitely can speak about the needs. I think also I am convinced that uh, it is from the needs that we will get our opportunities and that is what we should look into. As you all know, Marvel, uh, Africa is a marvelous continent. Uh, it has most of the potential wealth for our world development. It's full of natural resor resources and we all know that, but it has in my view two uh, very important assets. One of them is the youth, the other one is the capacity for growth. And I think that this is where we will find our opportunities. Uh, leaders and entrepreneurs uh, from all over the world, they have known for a long time that Africa has all this potential and they have, because of that, decided to invest there. A lot of countries, a lot of big, big companies have invested in Africa for a long time. But mainly they came to Africa with the idea of uh, taking their share of this wealth. We did it always, or most of the times, with the short-term ob objective and with the aim of getting richer. They mainly took away uh, the wealth from Africa. They, have, they had to come to the markets and show that they were growing. They had to improve their statistics. They had to impress the stock market to increase their own value. And that was uh, their main aims. I think that this had a terrible effect in Africans' uh, development. It raised the will to get rich. It gave a lot of uh, um, wrong information to the people that uh, the most important things were getting rich, getting as much money as you can, and not considering the very important African society improvement, which is, in my view, the most important uh, thing we should we should be in there. We should be creating a better structured society and we should give uh, the opportunity to Africa to become a stronger contributor for the world development. And that is why I think that we have to invest in Africa. It is very important. It is very important to allow Africa to be partner in the development of the world. It, and they have a lot of potential to, the, to do that. But it's also important to give our companies opportunities of growth 
And that is also the second one. The thing is that by doing this, we will have, uh, we, are, we will be doing our own job of investing on those who need us. And I think this is a very, very strong message. But we have to do it in based on different premises. We have to go to Africa investing on the long term. We have to guarantee the sustainability of our investment. We have to be uh, working focused on helping people to get developed, to develop themselves. We have to invest a lot of the, on growing the structure of the people in Africa. We know all that developed people are more productive and products and uh, acts better, produces better. We also know that uh, developed people are more happy people and that is very important for us. Considering structuring societies and caring for the environment is guaranteeing the secured investment. And that is for us very important. We do this, if we do this, we will have a good opportunity in Africa. We will be taking care of our neighbor and of the needed, and that is one of our aims. The short-term investment evaluated exclusively by the profits was responsible for three things that are very, very bad in Africa. Corruption, growth of poverty, and the development of unstructured societies. It was a factor of stagnation and death. And that's why I think that we have to change all that. We must believe, we have to understand that our way is the right way. We have to bring our way of work, the normal way of work that we have, into our investments in Africa. We have to give Africa a fair support to contribute to the world's development with the enormous capacities of its resources. And it will give investors the, stead the steady return of their income. And that is why Union Park has been working a lot with Africa. We have been investing in Africa for a long time now. We have worked with uh, programs to uh, help developing the youth in Africa. We have worked a lot on education. We have invested in education. We have uh, uh, worked on projects to improve life in Africa. We, are, we have a prof uh, program where we are trying to get uh, uh, water for everybody in Africa, which is very important. We have invested on, on education. We have invested on the new leaders, creating new leaders, giving them the capacity and the support for them to become uh, the new uh, leaders in Africa. But the most important thing that uh, we need to do in Africa is to show uh, that our day-to-day -day way of work within the companies, with the businesses, is exactly the things that I have mentioned before. In practical ways, we have to bring to the day-to-day -day all these concepts, the concept that we have, uh, the capacity of believing, the capacity of working in terms of uh, the right ways uh, and in the line of what UNIAPAC promotes. UNIAPAC has a very strong work on uh, showing the world that business is a noble vocation. We have uh, worked a lot on trying to guarantee that uh, we work on good goods and uh, good products and good and good uh, services. We work on uh, uh, trying to ev uh, evolve on the good work and creating good wealth. And that is very important. But we also share always the preoccupation that uh, the, the reason for companies to exist is to uh, create wealth. But there's a very important uh, objective for us entrepreneurs and companies, which is to distribute fair, uh, fairly the wealth that we have created. We don't finish our job if we don't do that. So we have to invest in Africa with the belief that we are doing uh, the same uh, approach that we have elsewhere. We need above all to have the courage to believe not to give up at the first setback, step back, get involved with the society in which, in which we invest so that we belong to that society, put the person as the main objective of our work, 
not to judge, but to give the example, and we will be recognized and respected. As, Paul, as Pope John, John Paul said on his first appearance, do not be afraid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, ending with uh, this uh, uh, encouraging uh, also final sentence from the Pope and uh, a former Pope. And um, yeah, you mentioned uh, long-term sustainability, working within the companies, but also training young entrepreneurs, uh, creating wealth, but also fair distribution of wealth. So uh, key uh, words that, uh, and I had the chance to uh, be in touch with a number of uh, the members of uh, UNIAPAC in uh, African countries, and I've seen the impact of uh, Christian entrepreneurs, your members, uh, and we are also happy to have the different wings of, uh, you know, uh, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Orthodox. Uh, it's really an ecumenical and also interfaith approach that we have. And with that, we come, and I uh, want to just to say that we have uh, now uh, still one speaker uh, divided into two, uh, Roland Schatz and Günther Nocke. Welcome, both of you. And uh, then a short uh, in, uh, announcement of um, Timo. So we will uh, take five more minutes from the break, that means we, we hope to end at 10.15. Now, uh, Roland Schatz, uh, he's also president of uh, Geneva Gabe Foundation, uh, but you are a global actor in so many respects and uh, welcome uh, and uh, together with Günther Nocke uh, representing the German government, so to say, uh, which is a key player in all this um, um, uh, Europe, Africa, uh, one of the, if not to say, the most important player at the moment in the Africa, Europe uh, uh, investment and uh, also grants uh, relations. Roland, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to be back. Um, and I would like to pick up what Timo told us in the last session that we need a firework of ideas. And that is why I'm happy that uh, Günther is here to join. Um, because um, not only what the German government, but what others as well are trying to do is um, creating lighthouses for all of us uh, to get orientation. Um, if I manage to um, work with my screen, uh, let me see. Um, I'm I would just like to um, share with you one um, short deck, but I'm not able to do that. Um, no, that's not what it is. Well, whatever. Um, Pippa, could you help me out? Can you enable him to share the screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So um, what we have been doing since we met last year in um, Geneva, uh, we formed a nice partnership with you in Habitat making sure that walking the talk is able to uh, be done a little bit faster to ensure that nobody is left behind and at the same time that investments get more transparent. Pippa, can you jump to slide four? Um, the main point of this is number one, starting with reforestation, but doing it in a way that we can combine it with AI as Anis had shared that already with us. If we go to slide five, you can see that thanks to the Japanese kiri tree, we are able to plant trees which not only grow fast and create value because of the wood, but at the same time um, creating shade. So at the same time, when you support climate via reforestation, you are able to do reforestation. Now, if you look into the corner of the top at the right side, you see something which looks at the first glance not fitting to a tree, which, because that is the stock exchange in Stuttgart. The friends in Stuttgart have developed since three years an opportunity that you can trade carbon credits. And that is what we talk about going full circle. If you go to the next slide, you can see a little girl planting trees. And as these trees will be combined with a chip, 
this enables every person who plants the trees later on when the tree is growing with the leaves to then get reimbursed either via their own SDG card or other platform. We jump further to the next slide. It works not only in the, uh, in the uh, field of reforestation and agriculture, it works as well in the field of healthcare. We are all um, struggling uh, with COVID. Thanks to our partners from San Marino, the Lemonade Group, they now been able to develop a system that those who need support, that they can get this not necessary by having to see their doctor or walk into the hospital, but that AI is able to help them. In the last slide, this works logically as well for education. Well, not the last one, but uh, the next one, sorry. Um, that um, you, you can provide education in all areas, whether it is music education, forming orchestras, and last point, what is important, that is what I meant at the beginning, we need to create global visibility for these lighthouses. That would be my quick intro to give the floor to Gunther because he's actually the one who walks the talk in Africa for, I would almost say, decades. And let's listen to him, what he has been starting years ago and where he could see partnerships with all of you attending this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland, and uh, welcome, uh, Gunther Noke, really, as uh, somebody who is uh, dealing with great um, impact uh, transfers, Germany, Africa, you have the floor. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Roland. Uh, I'm uh, speaking on behalf uh, of uh, my own capacity, <laughs> uh, on my own capacity, not for the German government, but I'm based in the Ministry for Development Cooperation. And I can say, that my uh, development policy minister, Gerd Müller, is very interested in a cooperation uh, with uh, traditional leaders or religious leaders. And we have a second uh, department, uh, uh, a specific department here in, in uh, Berlin and, and Bonn, where we are based for religion and development. And that is very interesting also to maybe leverage investments, uh, not only with the private sector, but also with uh, organizations like Face Invest or others. And uh, I will only uh, uh, present a few uh, examples what we can do. And we have spoken about the, the issue of investment climate and uh, corruption and uh, the problems uh, with governments uh, or governance in the African countries or many of the African countries. And uh, the main issue is there are two uh, opportunities to combat or to uh, create uh, opportunities in Africa. That is, you mentioned it, use, and on the other hand, digitalization. And the new technology uh, is one thing what we have to uh, be aware of. Roland mentioned blockchain uh, technologies with the, the stock exchange in uh, Stuttgart, and this creates the necessary transparency for the investors and also for our uh, uh, ministry, for instance, to uh, be sure that uh, the money is well invested, the money of the German taxpayers. Uh, the transparency means uh, not only data banks, but that means uh, also the, all the transaction like blockchain. The, the other thing uh, with digitalization is, uh, enabling solutions that can be scaled quickly across a country, a region, a, an entire continent, a mobile payment, now increasingly digital money or uh, currencies. And of course, we also can bridge the distance between investors and producers, workers, consumers, buyers, uh, through platforms. The platform economy is a chance for a continent, uh, like for a continent like Africa. Uh, the outsourcing from uh, back office or other function. Let me let me present only a few examples of digital projects I have developed uh, when I started in the ministry to promote uh, 
this uh, kind of uh, ICT uh, new technologies in the Ministry 2013. Um, one is uh, the platform vidu.africa, w-i-d-u.africa, using a digital platform, leverage remittances from the African diaspora in Germany to create jobs and livelihoods uh, in micro businesses by supporting entrepreneurs in Africa. The project was designed jointly uh, with the diaspora and successfully piloted in Cameroon and Ghana and will now be scaled up to Kenya, Ethiopia, Togo and uh, other countries maybe uh, are in the pipeline, Tunisia, uh, Senegal, Tanzania. This project can also uh, or can of course be rolled out in, in all countries where Germany has a uh, sizable uh, diaspora, but also be used in other EU countries or Switzerland for linking their diasporas uh, with African countries. Um, so far, we do facilitate uh, small investments between 500 and uh, 2,500 euro. And uh, that is only possible by using the IT school uh, tools and not to uh, uh, have uh, uh, yeah, uh, investigation uh, uh, troops uh, or groups on the ground to control this 500 uh, euro. This might uh, then also provide an investment opportunity for the audience here when this could be scaled up maybe for, for as a bigger uh, investment. But now it's, it, it's more focused on banco businesses and, and uh, a lot of uh, those uh, informal sector investments. Um, the strategic partnership is another project. Uh, that means uh, the business community and, poli uh, and politics uh, work together in a now called a strategic partnership technology in Africa. Uh, 200 German and European companies uh, working together in the tech uh, sector. The partnership provides advisory support for product development, innovation, and hands-on support on the ground uh, through the German Chambers of Commerce abroad. This can be used, also the German uh, embassies and, uh, and missions in the countries. This facilitates uh, investments that might not have been realized uh, if the entrepreneurs had to enter the African market on their own. Um, the uh, strategic partnership uh, uh, strategic partnership uh, provides grants to investments that have a development angle that means uh, combined private and uh, yeah uh, societal in interests uh, another very interesting project uh, is running by the german development bank kfw we developed a so-called true budget a blockchain-based public uh, appenditure tool to track and coordinate the implementation of donor-funded investment projects. That could also be interesting for investments of the private sector if the tool uh, will be used. We started uh, the piloting in Burkina Faso and Ethiopia and has, a, and of course, uh, that has the potential of greatly increasing uh, the transparency and efficiency of economic cooperation. The another, uh, uh, Maybe you very, can start then. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's together with the EU Commission in Addis, where we are creating a platform for the African Union Commission. And uh, the most interesting point uh, or project is, uh, and that's the last one, together with traditional leaders, also regional leaders, and that is called Our Village. Our village is an innovation for community-driven development in poor areas using a local community currency to enable liquidity constrained producers and consumers, uh, so-called prosumers, uh, to trade goods and services. And our village use a blockchain technology for facilitate the transactions to transform local communities these transactions are also contribute to a village just uh, which funds uh, activities benefiting the whole community. So it's a learning journey for the entire uh, village and small investments, uh, for, for instance, a mice mill or 
a local school, uh, accept the payments from the community currency are necessary to get uh, the system going. And we, we have uh, an increasing of li liquidity. And uh, of course, this also is uh, possible for a large uh, scale opportunity uh, to, to scale up in, in Africa in many different villages. And it's also a part of uh, a kind of uh, secure investment and is helping the people on the ground very directly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Günther, for these uh, very uh, inspiring, innovative examples that you, that you mentioned. Um, we ask for understanding that we uh, extended with our uh, session. I can announce already that we will have the uh, networking break session a bit shorter. That means we start the next uh, uh, plenary uh, session, um, no, the, sorry, the, the breakout sessions, uh, not at 30, but at uh, 35 or 40 latest. So, um, but it was important to hear that uh, there are a lot of um, innovative approaches around the world and to share them, to make them known, and also to include the faith based uh, partners. As we heard this morning uh, from uh, Nkata, uh, uh, religious organizations are still in the, on the ground in areas where often no other institutions exist and are present. So that's why also the cooperation between private sector, governments and faith-driven organizations should be strengthened in all this. And the, the, with this, we come to two short announcements, one from Timo and then uh, one from um, 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 Hong on uh, just two times one minute on the um, follow up. Timo? Yes, so thanks uh, to all contributors uh, and speakers for the great impulses. We want to follow up um, with the uh, the projects and examples uh, Günther Nockel already started uh, to, to draft some uh, opportunities. And uh, we would like to split uh, in six different areas to dig deeper into certain projects. So our goal and aim with this conference is uh, also interaction in the framework the online technology uh, gives us with this Hubilo platform. And we will split up uh, into the sectors of health, of agri-food and water, renewable energy and climate, education, financial and fintech, and last but not least, real estate. So uh, probably you have already made your decision and uh, get registered in advance of the conference, or you want to switch uh, during the, se uh, the session, which is uh, also possible, but um, it will get moderated, yes, but the moderators are not additional speakers in terms of a long uh, speech uh, or sermon about a certain issue. Uh, you should have your time to contribute your ideas, your examples and, uh, and opportunities. So make the best use of this time. Thank you, Timo, Thank you. And about uh, how to get there now on the Hubilu platform. Yes, I just quickly uh, give you instruction that you can go to the um, conference community. There is a rooms button. And then from there, you can see all the parallel sessions and uh, feel free to join. You, between the session, if, as Timo just mentioned, if you would like to interact to different uh, sessions, just go ahead to join. It's no re restriction at all. Thank you very much. Bye. It's like a physical conference, you know, you have one floor with the six rooms and uh, you go to one room and if it's boring, you go to the next one. But of course, it's not <laughs> boring, so you will stay in one, I guess. Thank you so much to all the speakers here. And um, uh, we take all that, we register all that. It will also be available on YouTube uh, later, but also we uh, will uh, digest and then uh, bring up all these ideas around the table from all your uh, speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, we close this session, have a short break and 35 the 
parallel sessions will be open. And you can also, as you know, we have other networking uh, possibilities over lunch, uh, one hour in the afternoon, um, 15 minutes, and then one hour at the end after the closing, you can still use the bilateral networking tools where you can uh, select a partner and say, can uh, we have a 15 minutes slot together during these breaks? Thank you. This Thank you. Is